Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Good morning and welcome, everybody. Uh, today's program is on troubleshooting problems in the ornamental garden, and our speaker is our special, our natural resources specialist, Nancy Berlin. Nancy, whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. Thank you. Special natural resource specialist. <laughs> it's good to have you all here today. And I just want to give a caveat before we get started that um, we're going to we're going to look at a lot of problems, um, but solutions can be complex. So um, this will this will help you know what to look for. And um, and then the solution probably would best come from submitting a sample or some photographs to the Extension Horticulture Help Desk um, for, for the best research-based solution that gives us time to think through it without guessing what the problem is. So we'll proceed with that in mind. Um, let's see, so scouting um, uh, involves knowing your plants. And so a little walk around your yard every couple days, I, I tend to do it every day as a way to relax, but knowing your plants, who's visiting them, um, uh, I like to see what pollinators are out there. The, these are just a few of the insects that I see, and, and these are all beneficial insects, but you can also catch some of the, um, some of the pests there too, or you might even catch a predation event going on, uh, knowing what the needs of the plants that you actually select are, and what are the common problems. We teach master gardeners to, you know, know that oaks have uh, a lot of insect galls on them, or uh, photinia has leaf spot almost all the time, or, you know, spruce mites are often found on dwarf Alberta spruce. Sorry, Linda. <laughs> and scout to scout for those kind of problems that you know are common. So as you scout, identify what the problem is. You're looking for signs and symptoms, signs that somebody's been there and done some damage, symptoms of a disease that might be occurring in one part of the plant and could spread to another part. Um, and different pests can have different signs and symptoms. So that's why this becomes kind of complex. And, you know, there might be a combination of, of insect and disease uh, problems. So determine if a control is really, really necessary. Um, you want to um, identify the control options, but it must match, match the pest or the disease to be effective. And that's another reason why, um, you know, scouting, finding the signs and symptoms and shooting some pictures of that to us uh, to help you decide, you know, what the threshold for this is. Is this really a cosmetic problem or is it something that you need to kind of jump on? Most of our recommendations from the Extension Horticulture Help Desk are cultural in nature, something to do with uh, taking care of the plant in a different way, a better way, or sanitation, cleaning up something that's already occurred. And um, very few of our, our recommendations end up being uh, a chemical uh, control, although that is appropriate in some situations. So, and Understanding the pros and cons of each control method are important too, and we can help you to um, think through that. So some good things to remember. Um, let's see if I can get rid of that screen thing there. I can't. Okay, so some insects and diseases are easily recognizable. Avoid Facebook groups that are not affiliated with extension or an educational facility. There's a lot of bad information going on out there with people guessing at what something is. Um, uh, even in the really good groups, if you read through the thread, sometimes there's a lot of people guessing at what they think it is. And until somebody who's knowledgeable comes along and makes the correction, uh, you can be led down the wrong path. Examine the plant thoroughly for insects and, and um, you can, um, and diseases. Sometimes snapping a lot of photos can help you enlarge it later to um, see it better and maybe use um, iNaturalist to identify uh, what the plant is or what the insect is. 
Uh, fungal diseases are the most common thing that we see. You know, we live in Northern Virginia and you know what, it's like a sauna most days in the summer, July and August are grueling, but um, there are also some bacterial diseases to be aware of. Well, I'll show you some pictures later. And in some cases, a virus can be present and it might only show that virus symptom under a certain condition. And that has a totally different control than a fungal insect or a bacterial problem. Many of the problems that we see are the results of improper planting, improper care, the wrong plant in the wrong place, and or an unfavorable environmental condition, which, you know, we've really kind of had that this summer, you know, with all of a sudden we get a lot of rain and then we get scorching hot weather and then we get scorching hot weather with wind that desiccates plants so it's it's been a challenging year and remember a plant can have more than one problem so integrated pest management and thanks thomas for this slide it's from penn state extension um, it's a it's a process to deal with pests and diseases so it involves scouting and then finding all the available options and choosing the least toxic alternative um, with minimal or no uh, potential harm to humans or non-target species. So let's talk about environmental problems first, since they tend to be um, very common at the help desk. And this can include site problems, uh, drought problems, which we've been in uh, droughty conditions for a long time now, a number of years, and they come and go. Or uh, the deluge, you know, the the huge rainstorm followed by the hot weather, temperature variations, even in the winter months, light problems with light or planting problems. So let's talk about those first. So we might see that a plant, we often see that a plant is planted or mulched too deeply, especially with trees and shrubs. And I'll show you some pictures later. You all are mostly familiar with that probably from our other classes or it's the wrong site. Uh, and I'm always having to move plants around based on the conditions in the microclimates in my yard. I'll think that something is getting partial sun and then suddenly a mature tree will be taking up a lot more sunlight than uh, it used to. So, um, you know, be, be ready to be um, to, to, to change things up as they are needed. Sometimes it, things are planted too late and I'll show you some pictures of that uh, soil. We have urban soils here that are very disrupted, uh, the poor quality or turned upside down so the A horizon is on the bottom, if it, there is any A horizon and the C horizon is on the top, and it's not matched to the plant's needs. And it's probably been run over by um, heavy equipment or foot traffic and, it, and it's compacted. Sometimes there's a perch water table, uh, water that's in the root zone and there's poor drainage or circling roots and burlap and wire cages are found around trees all the time when they're excavated. And many trees are planted poorly in our urban settings. And so their life lifespan is very short. So here's a here's a tree on the um, this one right here is um, we can't see the root flare. Uh, there's a number of things <laughs> that are wrong here. Um, the root flare um, looks like this on the right, and we should see that above the soil line. And most plants are planted so they look like telephone poles. So that needs to be above ground to get air, uh, to prevent uh, vole damage, to prevent insect damage, and to avoid stressing the tree. This turf is also growing up right next to the tree and the turf will win. It will take all the nutrients and all the water and the tree will, won't fare well in this situation. Plus there is some chemical disadvantage for the tree roots in this area here. So we want to mulch out as far as we can. Yeah, I'm working toward mulching my trees out to the drip line and I have a ways to go, but um, that reduces the stress on them too. So they don't have to compete with turf. This is obviously mulch strong. Yeah, if you've attended any of our other situations, this is particularly egregious. Um, and th this is a tree that's planted the way it should be with the root flare and some prop roots growing out and it, it's getting air circulation. It doesn't have mulch around it, but a uh, leaf litter left here or, or mulch will help cool the roots. Um, it, but um, if you can't get to it, um, as just make sure that the roots ha um, can come to the surface and aren't covered with uh, concrete or other uh, structures. 
So a lot of times we see people that are in the wrong, uh, planting things in the wrong zone. You know, they see something tropical and they want to leave it out all winter. And it, that, we know that just doesn't work. So um, Prince William County is divided into two zones, 7A and 7B. And the coastal zone is 7B. And it's east, roughly east of 95. And so th there, the soils are different. The topography is different. And west of 95, we're considered in the Piedmont, and that's 7A. You know, but keep in mind, things things are changing. Our, our zones are not, um, you know, as things get warmer or or we get more rainfall, uh, things can change. So just be aware and, and kind of monitor the news on uh, uh, conditions, weather conditions in your zone. But that's, that's generally a good rule. So sometimes we see heaving or cold damage. And uh, I know we're not really thinking about cold damage right now, but, you know, we're also think I'm thinking about fall already, you know, and cooler temps and, you know, what I can put in in the fall when it's less torrid outside. And I always remember the quote of Alex Namira, the Virginia Tech horticulture professor. And he only came here, he only came here once. Um, but he, he said this quote, it's not how cold it gets, it's how it gets cold. And this is so applicable for Virginia because we can be uh, in the spring, it can be look, looking like it's going to be spring weather. And then suddenly we get a hard freeze. And if it's sudden cold um, and but the buds are vulnerable, then we see that happen to hydrangeas quite a lot. There's an excellent article from Fairfax Master Gardeners, a link down here on hydrangeas and it's really well written and this picture is taken this picture down the right is taken from that and every year we get calls about hydrangeas why why um isn't my hydrangea blooming and it, it might be due to a number of problems the macrophylla is usually the one that has a damaged bud so frozen tissue can look like this heaving can look like this picture right here and if um it could the freeze thaw cycle pushes it out of the ground. So make sure you get your plants in that sweet spot between um, cooling temperatures, a little bit more rainfall in the fall and, um, and, and the frost date. So avoid planting after the frost date with some exceptions. There are some native plants that kind of need, need that if you're going to seed them or uh, there are some, some other uh, non-natives that also uh, can be seeded after the frost, but be careful with your pruning times too. And I'll show you some resources for that in just a little bit. You may see leaf purpling with cold damage and it, um, if it's planted too early or too late, it can't absorb those nutrients because the ground uh, might be frozen and the roots are not able. And, and um, so it, you might see some discoloration. So soil in urban soils are just compacted and um, uh, there is a, um, on the Virginia Native Plant Society um, Facebook group, there, there is a professional named Bob Glennon, and he repeatedly, he works for USDA and NRCS, and he is just so wise. He's an older gentleman, probably nearing retirement, but I, I, I just think he offers so much great advice, and he always says over and over and over again, almost every day, your plant needs to be matched to the zone and the soil. Is the soil wet or dry? And, and how compacted is it? He, um, and that is just the best advice before we even select a plant that we should be thinking about what kind of soil we have uh, and the conditions that there is, there, there is in that soil. Compacted soil, we know, uh, results in poor plant growth. Or drainage problems in clay soil. We may get a hard pan under there that collects water. And wet, sticky soils, with, like clay, tend to be sort of low in organic matter and more susceptible to sticking together and compacting. And you need more than tilling to remedy this. You need uh, uh, amendments, and, um, and we can give you recommendations about that. But when in doubt, do a soil test. If you see symptoms or maybe you're starting a new new garden to put new plants in. And remember that rain can compact soil that's already showing some dense, some yeah, bulk density. And um, 
in addition to an in, one tilling and then no tilling, uh, a cover crop. I, I use cover crops in some bare areas of my uh, landscape. Um, it's not always used in ornamentals, um, but I, I have found it helpful um, while I am waiting to do some um, some planting. So a perched water table um, is when water collects right right about at the root zone, and it's because there is either compaction or a soil mismatch um, between types of soil uh, in the area of the root zone we're talking about here. Now, some plants prefer wet feet, and those those three plants on the side over here are just three examples, cardinal flower, joe pie, button bush. They like to not be sitting in water, but they like a wetter environment. So, so knowing what your soil is doing is important, and you might want to dig a hole like this picture shows and, and pouring some water in and see how quickly it drains. But remember, a consistently wet spot is not an appropriate place for a rain garden. We want a rain garden to drain completely in 48 hours. So again, if you're interested in a rain garden, uh, we can point you to some good resources for that. This picture on the left is from taken from uh, Linda Chalker Scott's um, discussion. She's a University of Washington professor. Um, and this is from her discussion with Joe Gardner about not using any rocks or ma uh, different material in the bottom of uh, container gardens. Because contrary to what your, what your conventional wisdom might say, there is water does collect here at the top of that rock layer because there's a mismatch and it creates a water table right there that, uh, and that's right about the root zone. So make the soil uniform in your containers. And that also goes for, um, for tree planting. Okay, so a lot of times we see circling roots. Uh, many urban trees have been planted with the burlap wire cage, circling roots, and, and that causes a, a tree to be stressed, to be more, um, more vulnerable to insect and disease pressure. Um, there's a lot of conflicting advice, even at EDU sites. Um, but some reputable people that I believe in um, say remove it all, remove all the circling roots, burlap, wire cage, cut any roots that are circling. And, and you can read more about that technique uh, at the University of Florida, Penn State, University of Washington has some good research on it. But even some arborist sites say partial removal is fine. Um, but I am convinced that our urban trees are under so much pressure that removal of all of these is um, advantageous. Um, sometimes you'll um, have a, a, a landscape company that will say your warranty is voided if you um, remove all this. And that's because it's easy. They want to transport the tree and plant it quickly. And so, um, and sometimes a tree um, that has been burlapped has a restricted root zone that hasn't been able to stabilize it. And they're, they're afraid they're going to have to come back out and the tree will have fallen over or it will be struggling because it's not rooted well. Um, and so a solution to that would be to plant uh, either a bare root seedling uh, or a tubling. A tubling is a small tree that looks just like this on the right. And I think they that is a cheaper alternative. As I get older, it's a lot easier for me to lift. You can see the root flare easily. You can correct any damaged roots. And um, and my the bottom line is my recommendation and not just mine, but the recommendation of some some um, extension services that I respect are to remove all of the wrapping. So there's a lot of signs and symptoms for diseases. These are just a few things that we can look for when we're looking around our yard to um, troubleshoot. Uh, we might see leaf spots or discoloration or puckering or root damage. And we'll look at some pictures of these. But the question that we're going to ask you if you call is how widespread is this? Is this just one plant? Um, is it on a whole bunch of plants? Is it on different types of plants? And 
is it normal for this plant? Some things that, that we think look rather odd could be normal. So examine any new plants you're gonna you're gonna bring into your yard and buy from a reputable vendor. Um, if you have a problem, report that to the seller because some of our uh, worst diseases like boxwood blight um, have to be reported back to the seller so that um, the, manuf the, the grower can um, modify things or send out an alert. So just look over the entire plant for damage to leaves or stems, the roots or insect damage. And it might just be cosmetic, but look it over and be a good consumer uh, and buy something that looks healthy. So here's some leaf problems that we see most commonly. And they're, they're starting to show up. Uh, they started to show up at the um, middle of July. Uh, so you might see yellowing, and this could be caused from insect damage. It could be caused from disease. It could be a nutrient deficiency. This rust, this orange, bright orange color, really common on service berry. Um, and I planted hollyhocks this year. I'm watching them for rust. And there's really not much you can do for rust. Um, bar putting on a fungicide, which uh, usually is just a Band-Aid approach. Uh, good air circulation is a good idea. Powdery mildew, which is on the top of the leaf, you'll see that fuzziness. Or downy mildew can show up as chlorotic spots, yellowish spots on the top of the leaf. But when you turn the leaf over, um, it has a mildew or the powdery, powdery stuff on the bottom of the leaf, fungal hyphae. Um, you might see cupping. Or you might see spots that are coalescing and then falling out. So if you see any of these, this, this class is not going to be able to tell you the solutions to all these things. But these are just some things that you can troubleshoot and, and either uh, pursue by looking at a .ext site. Um, for a search term, I might put in rust or hollyhocks .ext or powdery mildew, monarda, or bee balm, uh, .edu, something like that, and then get research-based information. But don't guess. If you're not sure what the problem is, give us a couple pictures. Cankers on stems, uh, fungal growth on stems, or dieback. Uh, this, this particular disease here is southern blight. It's in the in the stem that going down into the roots, you see some fungal growth. This is black knot, and these are stem cankers and die back on just a certain stem. So those are the things we're looking for. And again, it's it's complex, and it may be more than one problem. So we need a sufficient sample or a really clear, good pictures. And if we can't determine what the problem is, um, there is a fee, but we can send um, it to the pathology lab at Virginia Tech. Uh, to help you to diagnose the problem. Roots can be damaged by root rot or wet areas or constricted. Uh, these roots obviously are constricted in the pot and uh, you can free those by cutting some of those roots and spreading them out in the planting hole. Fungus gnats will appear in a container uh, where the, where the, um, the roots are too wet, you're watering too frequently, uh, constructions, and certainly at the addition of asphalt or any kind of structure in your yard can damage roots. Um, or we see some root rot here, and are the roots, do they have an odor? Can you slough off the outer sheath of the roots? Um, that, that can indicate a root problem. We see a lot of different flower problems, too. This... Um, Misshapen flowers are distorted. Um, this is um, getting reported on the, some of the um, some of the alerts that I've had. This is um, aster yellows. This is aster yellows also. It occurs. Oops. It occurs in the aster family. It causes this unusual growth. It, it's a. I think. It, I might be wrong. I think it's it's viral. Uh, I, I, no, phytoplasm, excuse me, which is kind of between a virus and a bacteria, I believe. And it causes, it's carried by the oriophid mite. So you might see this on your cone flowers or your, your fall asters. And um, there's no cure for it. Um, you need to remove the ones that are affected. So watch out for that. There's kind of yellowing of the foliage and this unusual growth. That's both of these here. And this is uh, dogwood. 
uh, and it has uh, a discola um, uh, anthracnose on the on the flowers. So discolored flowers, and this is a this is something you'd want to jump on. It's it, it will eventually fatal to the tree, but you can minimize the damage. This just grows rosette, which causes it's a virus that causes unusual uh, gro red growth. Now, the roses do have their new growth is often red, but this is which is brooming. And the one of the key symptoms is um, the the thorns are pliable rather than sharp. So you want to look for that, and that needs to be removed. Um, and sometimes you see a lot of aphids. Oh, if you have milkweed, you definitely going to see aphids and milkweed bugs and all sorts of other critters living on that. But they can uh, affect the flower growth too. So this, these are things that you're going to look for, and um, and uh, you know, to help you with diagnosis. And what's normal? This plant on the left is pulmonaria. It's normal for it to have those white spots. It's lungwort. And that middle tulip, that, that looks like that because of a virus. And this is not a very clear picture, but this is sweet gum. And it has the, some of the older growth gets these flange stems. So, you know, before you grab for some neem oil or, or, or any kind of uh, control, you want to make sure that um, what you're seeing is not just normal um, pattern for that plant. So I, before we do say something about insects, is the 15, 16 years I've been in this job, things have changed dramatically. Uh, people would contact us about something eating their plant. And um, I can remember thinking um, that that was pretty normal, but um, things have changed over the years, and it is pretty normal. If you're not, if something isn't eating your plants, then you probably don't have an ecosystem. Now, granted, we want to minimize how much the insects or wildlife get of our plants, but some feeding damage um, uh, or signs and symptoms that insects have been there is to be expected in our garden. So some signs of feeding or insect presence might be window painting. So these are all terms you might hear flagging or you might see some cast skins or insect eggs or cottony or shiny trails or chewed leaves. So let's look at some pictures of this. But the type of plant and the type of damage on that plant gives important information. Our lecturer in entomology for years used to say, the most important thing about diagnosing insect damage is knowing what the plant is and what time of year it is. And that will, give, that will direct you most often to the problem. So here's some insect eggs, a couple different types of insect eggs. This is flagging, and that looks like something fed on it or, or a fungal uh, disease might be there too. Uh, this is a spittle bug with his, I think they're so cool, but um, people get a little alarmed when they see that mass of spittle on. And this is window painting from a, like from a rose slug. And these are aphids um, that are congregating and creating that cottony mass. So all of these are some insect signs you might see. Um, here's a few more. Uh, this is a leaf miner that's, cre that's mining out the nutrients in the two layers two or more layers of the leaf cuticle, and, um, and that's generally just a cosmetic problem. This looks like a disease or maybe a nutrient problem, and it could be. It could be combined with insect feeding damage, but this is stippling, and the, some insect with a sucking mouth part has um, sucked up the nutrients out of certain areas of that leaf. Um, and um, let's go down here and look at this one first. This is... Uh, Honeydew, so sticky substance on the leaves um, from a from one of these critters that sucked all the juice out. They've sucked the sugar out of the leaf, and then they've pooped all over the leaf, and then it grows a secondary sooty mold on it. Sometimes we might find this around our hostas or other uh, plants, and those are just trails from slugs. And of course, everybody's familiar with the window painting that Japanese beetles do. Um, so, you know, we can give you some control recommendations. Um, at, when you're when you're at this stage, we generally just recommend a, you know, knocking them into a soapy water. 
Here's some uh, other damage that you see on for Japanese beetles or, or aphids, and a strong spray of water can clean those aphids off. Um, you know, there are other options too. Mites, this looks like a disease, but this is actually stippling on these leaves, and the, the mites have uh, created some webbing here. Webbing alone doesn't tell you you have mites. You can use a, uh, a white piece of paper and hold it underneath the branches and knock the branches to see whether you get any mites that fall off and they're, you know, eight-legged and they scurry and they're tiny. And um, mealybugs uh, can, can uh, show up in mass quantities on houseplants and outdoor plants. Caterpillars feeding uh, can defoliate, especially the top tender growth or borers. And these are common insects we're seeing now, leaf hoppers and plant bugs that are doing some damage. Uh, the key is not to have any knee-jerk reaction to use a not, to not use a, a broad spectrum that will kill a lot of different insects, including the beneficials that will come to eat these uh, pests. Uh, sometimes you see um, this This is a scale insect, and it, I think this is a magnolia scale. And you can see when you take that covering off, the little babies are in there and getting ready to hatch out. And so Virginia Tech has studied to find out when certain crawlers appear and how many degree days or, or days above 55 degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, have occurred so that they can pinpoint when the crawler stage for different scale insects occur. So here's another scale insect here. This is wax scale. It looks like little somebody lost their pink bubble gum on it. Underneath those scales are the incubation chamber for, for scale insects to emerge. So timing when the treatment occurs should be based on research from, from a reputable institution. This is a gall, really common on a lot of trees, but um, this is a gouty gall, uh, particularly oaks. They have an interesting variety, and generally this is a cosmetic problem um, and, and doesn't require any control. Now, if, if, if a tree has a lot of galls on it, like my witch hazel had a tremendous amount, and I could tell that it was stressed by the amount of insect damage that it was, occur it was occurring. And so I did uh, meet its cultural needs better. I irrigated it more. I made sure it was mulched right. I pruned a few out. But a lot of the um, gall-making insects are wasps, um, and they're beneficial. Um, Here's some puckering of the leaves, or here's some other oak galls that form, and, and they're, they're just insect houses on the on leaf or stem. So slugs, this is typical slug, slug damage, and they have um, scraping mouth parts, so they scrape away the leaf as they eat it. And, uh, you know, leopard scrub, slugs are really, really common, and I didn't realize that they were considered invasive now, so... I pretty much clean them up um, and put them in soapy water. Uh, but here you have leaf cutter bee damage, and, and leaf cutters um, are a beneficial pollinator. And so they've take, taken their mouth parts and cut out a perfect little leaf on the edge. They tend to like thinner plants. And so we don't want to jump to the conclusion that any leaf damage uh, by that looks like it's from an insect are um is is detrimental um that's not going to affect now this is this might spread disease and it probably the moist conditions that slugs live in will cause some fungus to form here but uh this this is purely cosmetic and we know that leaf cutter bees are important pollinators so here's some other scouting techniques again for mites you these are what mites look like and this is a, a part of a dwarf alberta spruce uh, that if it's browning and you can hold, uh, you know, white note card or piece of paper under the plant. You may also see webbing, but again, that could be spider webbing, a, an important predator. So don't rely on webbing alone. You want to see the presence of mites. So we can help you puzzle through that if you're having uh, things with uh, leaves that are stippled or uh, plants that are browning. They particularly like really hot, dry weather. Um, which we've had a lot of. So I, I'm expecting to get some calls about that. 
Yellow sticky traps can be useful for monitoring. They will catch the good guys too. Mostly the flying insects. These are the ones that are uh, found most commonly on yellow sticky traps. But that can give you a clue to what's going on in your plant. And you can buy these at you know any any box store or garden center. And they, they, sometimes they have a pheromone on them to attract things. But most of the time they're just you know a uh, you know a me mechanical way to catch things and see what see what's going on. Most of these, um, ex with the exception of fungus gnats um, and aphids, they don't do a whole lot of damage. So for resources, you, you can send signs and symptoms dam of damage to Master, Master Gardener at pwcgov.org. This is a really good site here, if you guys could put it in the chat for me. I, or I could, we can send it out later with the evaluation, but it's a I thought it was an excellent site that that showed you a lot of examples of insect damage. Now, wildlife, I can't I can't um, leave that out because we certainly do have a lot of that. Um, we we do a lot of spraying at the teaching garden with just a, a, a bad smelling product um, and, and make sure that we do it uh, after the rainfall for deer. This Rutgers deer resistant plant list is pretty good. Nothing is deer proof. Um, this Oklahoma State one is a new one I found that had had some good um, techniques also for deer. Trees from seed is a, a again, I feel like we're getting uh, on Facebook uh, some um, older gentlemen that have been in the profession for a really long time and have a lot of wisdom. Um, this uh, uh, arborist that is um, I think he's retired now, but he has such excellent advice. So if you can follow Trees from Seed, if you're on Facebook, um, he has some good suggestions about revegetating understory and combating deer pressure. So here's some samples of deer pressure, although I probably don't need to show you these. Um, these are deer topiaries here, or they nip all the flowers off of many plants in my yard or the deer rubbing that tends to be toward fall. I'm pretty sure I don't have to, you're not, you're familiar with these. Uh, voles and moles, um, remember that voles are vegetarians and moles are um, meat eaters, meaning they eat the grubs. So here's your mole and these are the grubs that it's looking for. So you might see these underground um, and, and in general, I, I look at them as aerating my soil and, and ridding my yard of grubs. Um, most some people don't appreciate <laughs> appreciate what they do for us, but I think they're part of that soil ecosystem, uh, and I, I'm not too concerned about them unless they make holes that I fall into, and then I just cover them up or um, you try to revegetate those. But voles make these kind of paths in your your lawn, and they're just looking to eat your plant roots, particularly the expensive plant that you just purchased. So um, there's a really good uh, Virginia Tech publication. Um, uh, with garden tips for moles and voles that compare the damage. So groundhogs and rabbits. I have I'm I have oh, I have a lot of groundhogs and I, I have friends that have lots of rabbits. And so um, exclusion. Um, they are a new uh, groundhogs are a nuisance wildlife, so they can be hunted under the proper conditions. But this is characteristic of the damage, and they particularly like my celosia that I'm growing for the Prince William County Fair. And I've tried to exclude them and tried various techniques. If you Google groundhogdamage.ext, you will find a large selection of suggestions for fencing out uh, groundhogs or rabbits, a, a clutch uh, that put over a can can help deter rabbits too. And there are some liquid repellents for rabbits that are sort of effective. So weeds, if if it's in the turf, uh, thick turf shades out the weeds. So we want you to try to get your turf thick and I can we can help you with that. So you want to send us a photo of the weed uh, and we'll give you current research based. This is this is crabgrass here, and it grows at the edge where the turf is very thin, and so it's a, it's an opportunist. It takes advantage of any bare areas. So um, and so uh, mulching, thick turf, 
um, proper lawn care it, um, is the way to go for that. Best Lawns is our lawn program, and it makes the most of um, your resources uh, by giving you the right information based on science. So as a master gardeners go to your home, uh, uh, do a soil test, an evaluation of the weeds in your yard, measure just the turf areas for square footage and give you the right uh, timing for applying any nutrients based on the science of the soil test from Virginia Tech. So uh, if you're interested in that program, you can email um, us at um, bestlawns at pwcgov.org. So uh, this is stilt grass and it's huge um, problem in our county. Um, get any weeds before they go to seed. Uh, and we can give you management recommendations for stilt grass. We have a, a good fact sheet and a lot of resources for that uh, that we can send to you if you have this weed. And um, there's a, there are some lookalikes with stilt grass, but stilt grass has that light midrib and it's looking like just this right now. And depending on the height of it and exactly where we are in the season, the management techniques are different um, because if you mow it at the wrong time, that will encourage it to produce seeds a little bit earlier. And then you'll be, um, you'll be dealing with it much longer than you need to. So determine your threshold, determine what weeds you have, and then ask us for the right management techniques. A few things about maintenance. Um, so fertilize based on only based on a soil test. Um, most most uh, trees and shrubs do not need fertilization. If it has some symptoms or concerns, we, we suggest that you get a soil test done so that we, we can know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, Calculate the square footage of your flower garden before you call us, and that, and then you can calculate then how much fertilizer and what kind of fertilizer to use. Uh, we have some soil test kits at Virginia from for Virginia Tech. They're ten dollars for a routine test, and that's really all you need. They're available at our office or Chin Library. I think a couple other libraries, Christina, if you remember the other libraries that they're at, if you could put that in the chat. But native plants generally don't need any fertilization there if they're selected carefully. Container grown plants do have a finite amount of nutrients in the container, so they will need regular fertilization. I find water soluble is easier to use, uh, particularly in a container. Uh, usually it's an N NPK ratio of one to one, but again, the soil test results will tell you exactly what you need to use. So we see, uh, Underwatering problems through the help desk and overwatering problems. And underwatering uh, create makes the tree more or plant more susceptible to insects and diseases. For for trees, one to five gallons per inch of caliper uh, size. So um, and you can determine just the radius and to get the cat the diameter to get the caliper size. Overwatering can be just as harmful as underwatering because it fills up the air spaces with water and the um, oxygen can't uh, get to the roots and there, there can be um, lots of problems with overwatering. So uh, generally, these are general irrigation tips. Water in the morning, uh, one inch per week, unless you get rainfall. If it's, if it is drooping in the afternoon, we all droop in the afternoon in this heat. So if it's drooping in the afternoon, that's probably normal. Uh, if it's drooping in the morning, it probably needs irrigation. Droughty conditions in our area have become routine. Um, monitor for wind. Uh, the heat plus the wind causes things to dry out quicker. Water your plants in a zone system so that you don't forget something. And it, do that until the ground is frozen. If the rainfall is insufficient. If you have newly planted trees and shrubs, baby them for uh, and check on them once a week. Uh, don't be planting anything now. Wait till fall or cooler temperature. Uh, and containers, they may need to be watered twice daily uh, these hot days. Um, let's see. Avoid overhead watering. Keep the leaves dry. Just water the soil. That prevents a lot of disease problems that we see. 
choose a healthy plant. They should be have healthy roots, not have mechanical wounds, have good leaf color. There shouldn't be a lot of weeds in the pot, although one or two, that's common. Uh, look for healthy, vigorous plants. And then plant, plant your tree or shrub right. Um, plant that root flare above the soil line in a hole that's three to four times wider the container than the container. Uh, and don't backfill with any um, peat moss or compost. Use just native soil because then you don't avoid that. You will avoid that perched water table. Uh, remove the burlap wires circling roots. And for, for perennials, um, this is often how we see uh, plants from the garden center come to us because they've been in the pot too long and they have a lot of circling roots. So you want, you'd want to free those roots by scoring it um, and then providing uh, what it needs uh, for sunlight and also water to help it get established in cooler weather. Choose a native plant. They do a lot better here. And Plant Nova Natives has some good tools to help you select. Uh, so go to that website often. Uh, again, water, water these perennials well. Pruning, we have pruning calendars at this website below. Prune with a sharp, clean tool, either a pruning saw or a bypass pruner and check out the timing to make sure you're time, timing your pruning at the right time. And if you're not sure what plant you have, you know, send us a snap a picture of it and we'll help you decide when the right time to prune it is. Proper pruning cuts protect that branch collar. It should be where those red lines are. That's where the cut should be made. And um, uh, protecting that will help the tree to uh, cordon off that area so it doesn't decay. Uh, mulching, again, incorrect mulching on the right. Uh, uh, making that root flare zone not have mulch over it. And mulching to the drip line if you can. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. So a little bit about site um, development. Uh, use the seasons to observe your plant's topography. You know, when we get one of those big rainfalls, do a walk around. Put your boots on and look for wet spots. And in the winter, look for spots where the snow melts last uh, to absorb, uh, observe any microclimates that you might have or, or changes in topography to get to know what your site looks like. And you can get it, as I mentioned many times, you can get help from us. So you can email the Extension Horticulture Help Desk. Is that the right email? Anybody? Is that yes. our new email? Yes, that's yes, a new email. Yes, that works. I should know this, but yes, that is our new email. Okay. Or consult eat.edu or .gov sites, something, somebody reputable. No out-of-state out of pesticide recommendations can be followed, though. We want to follow just the ones for, from Virginia Tech and Virginia State. And you can see one of our Master Gardener stars, Amy Fausch, um, did a really wonderful presentation on becoming a garden detective. You can watch that and many other uh, videos at um, our YouTube channel. And um, if you're going to bring a sample, do it Monday through Wednesday so it doesn't deteriorate in the post office over the weekend. Get a large enough sample. The conjunction between healthy and disease portions, uh, fill, fill a grocery bag. And don't put any damp towels in the bag to keep it moist. Uh, that just makes secondary fungus grow. Don't leave it in your car for extended periods. Act early. Don't, don't bring us dead plants. There's not much we can tell from a dead plant. Um, it should show uh, signs and symptoms of decline on your sample. And you can fill out the necessary forms. If we have to send it to Virginia Tech, again, Monday through Wednesday would allow us to do that without a, sending a deteriorated sample. Um, we have a lot more things coming up. We have uh, August 13th, Saturday in the Garden on propagation and cover crops. Uh, we'll be back at the Garden on the 23rd of August for our turf and weeds that we missed in July in the evening, though. Um, and then tree planting uh, in September, shade gardening in October. And here's our Zoom classes coming up next on August 3rd. Thomas is going to be talking about troubleshooting problems in the vegetable garden. So similar to this, but with vegetables. 
and then cool season crops. Uh, that's going to be Max, our intern. And then we have a great speaker. Not that we're all not great, but I'm thrilled to have Celia Vakula come back. She's a private land biologist with NRCS, and she's going to be talking about pollen specialists being their host plants. A truly great presentation. Don't miss that one. And all of our Zoom classes are, have, are posted on VCE Prince William YouTube. So go there for lots and lots of listening. Um, and these are where you register for any of these classes that are coming up. So um, the, you can go to the Prince William County website and just search Virginia Cooperative Extension to find these. So I know that was a lot and we can give you a lot of solutions, but what we want you to do is start thinking and start watching and start looking for problems that we can maybe help you with. So I'll entertain any questions now. Do you want me to read them, Nancy? I would love, uh, either anybody. Are slugs or snails bad to gardens besides the cosmetic issues on the leaves? Well, they can, they can transmit some, I mean, the conditions that they're living under, it's hard to say what's actually causing the problem, but because they like that moist, uh, damp, dark type, and that, that's perfect for fungal. So I'm not, you know, I'm just not sure that they are the transmitters of, of any problems, but usually they're a signal that those conditions for that plant um, are, the you know, the bottom leaves of a plant are if they're getting eaten. So... That's what I would say. I would say it's both. It's both the slug and the condition. My hibiscus was damaged in the lace leaf pattern well before the Japanese beetles appeared. Is there any other insect that might cause this problem? I never observed any insects on the leaves. Hibiscus? Yes. Yeah. So... Okay, so, so this is a great example. This is what I would do if you brought me a hibiscus sample that had window painting. And this you can do at home. You can become a nature detective. I would put uh, hibiscus window pane damage dot ext on the search terms. And then, you know, don't make any guesses. We can help you puzzle through that too. I mean, we're here to help you. But uh, yes, there are other insects. Rose slugs, they're not on, are they on hibiscus? I don't know. See, I don't know all the pests that are on hibiscus. Another option would be to put hibiscus um, pests.ext or .edu and find out what the options are and look at some pictures of insect damage. There are, there are a numerous insects that do window painting. I overpruned my knockout roses this year, and they look exactly as the photo in your slide. Will they recover next year? Okay, so if hard to say, because because my picture of them showed a virus. So, but what happens when you prune? Uh, when you prune anything, it generates hormones, and it it wants to produce more growth. It says, "You cut me." I'm going to come back. So it's, it, you might have some witches brooming that is because of the pruning, not because of disease or virus. So I would watch your rose bush carefully. The new growth will be red and it will be, it could witches broom, like out, go out in a number of different angles. Um, but if it, if it um, has supple, uh, uh, thorns, uh, and it has, an, you know, a lot of witches grooming, just very odd growth, you know, shoot, get some pictures or bring us a sample of that, okay, because, you know, it's, I can't say for sure what, what's going on there. Um, please share remedies for compact soil. I'm just getting to know my mature garden after moving in seven months ago. I just found out some sections of the backyard with cracked soil and there's full shade and thin lawn. And I'm going to put my two cents in that yes. arbor wood chips um, in your flower beds and other compact areas have the research has shown and the garden professors talk about this often um, really help with compact clay soil, but you go ahead. 
So what Rob, that's good, good advice. What Robin is saying is you can cover that area until you're ready to plant it with, you know, three, four or five inches of, of wood chips. And you can get those, at, you can go to chip drop with, and, and get an arborist to drop chips, but it's a lot of chips. So you have to be ready for that, but cover that area. And what will happen is that will try to start to regenerate the soil. And you might, um, Thomas, you want to weigh in on, you know, cover crop. Is this, is this a lawn area, by the way? Let me see who it was. Carol. Okay. So, uh, um, anyway, um, you know, you covering up compost first, um, putting in a cover crop, depending, and then scratching the soil to make sure the seeds make contact, uh, poor aeration if it's in a, in a lawn, but, you know, make sure it's irrigated well or it's after a rainfall. So it sort of depends on what you're growing and exactly what the conditions are and are there trees around. So if you could shoot some pictures of your, um, of the compacted soil, what, tell us what's growing there, tell if it's a lawn or ornamental, and then um, give us your address and we can look it up on a county mapper to tell a little bit more about what the soils are there in that area. And she says it's a lawn area, so okay. um, we, there's a lot of good tips for that. Yeah, and, and you can sign up for our best lawns and that will all be evaluated um, a lot better than I can do on here. And if it's shady, probably something like daikon radish is probably the cover crop you want to look into. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. Um, most, pr uh, most pruning example photo diagrams show where to make the cut to remove the branch. Where should the cut be made along the branch? For example, the branch is simply too long. <clears throat> yeah. Giving uh, it a haircut is what he's asking. Yeah. So what, what you want to avoid is you want to avoid um, shearing. Um, so if you have too long a branch, the way you reduce the, the height of like a shrub is to, to follow that branch all the way down to the trunk, whether it be a multi-stem trunk or not, and still make that pruning cut right at the branch collar. There you can do a heading cut, um, which takes a little more skill. So you could Google heading cut shrub .ext and it'll show you some pictures. But remember, get somebody reputable um, when you're looking for these things. So heading cut, but, you, but for if you're going to reduce the height, you're going to still follow that branch all the way down to the trunk and make that pruning cut in the right place so that that wound will seal up. The tree or shrub knows to seal that up because it compartmentalizes that any decay that occurs when you make the pruning cut at the right place. I think that's it. Any more questions? Did that answer that question? Um, it's from Jimmy. And oh, Jimmy. <laughs> I can demonstrate that. <laughs> I, and I think a lot of people, especially with um, on the edges of their property with beech trees that, that where their branches get really, really long and are yes. shading out some of our shrubs, you wouldn't cut that branch all the way back, would you? You can, you know, it depends. I mean, I, I have done that. I've waited till the dormant period, though. Don't be, don't cut it now. You know, again, you're regenerating growth if you don't, especially if you don't make the cut at the right place. Right. And, that, and then that becomes susceptible to cold damage when the new growth occurs. So, you know, it depends. Yeah. That's it, Nancy. Wonderful. Thank you for being a good audience. Those are great questions. Yes. Okay, so okay. well, you will be getting an evaluation. Please respond to that, and we can put some of these resources in that email too. It'll come um, in in a little bit, and then this presentation will be put on YouTube. Okay, thank you everybody for coming, and thank you Nancy for presenting. You're welcome. Goodbye. We'll see y'all next time. If you enjoyed this video. Please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at mastergardener at 
pwcva.gov. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.